Great. Uh, well, thank you all. Thank you very much to the organizers, Luke in particular, but to all his sterling team who have done a wonderful job throughout the weekend. And uh, you know, Luke sold me the conference, basically, as, as he sold all of us. Um, I wasn't at the 94 conference. I wasn't at the 95 or the 96 one. So I was sold the idea that this was a, a revival of a cult community that I wasn't part of. But I was part of the work of those people that were here over those years. And I want to spend a bit of my 25, 30 minutes talking about um, how those ideas have shaped my career, the kinds of ideas that I've had, the kind of work that I've undertaken, and, um, and to try to reflect a bit on this concept of the virtual future. There's always you know, a double-edged sword being the final speaker. You, on the one hand, are you know, waiting for your talk and have to wait quite a long time. You're also aware that people are quite tired by the end of the conference, so you think you've got to really do something special. Um, but at the same time, you get to get lots of great ideas from others that are here already and get to meet lots of really interesting people like writers, like filmmakers, philosophers, sociologists, artists, performance artists. And, um, and that uh, belief that this, this, kind of this conference was going to be that kind of community really compelled me to wanting to be here. And it was, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, we were talking just at the break about what sorts of conferences are worth going to. And it seems to me that the kinds that are worth going to are those that bring such a range of people to talk to the kinds of subject that we're interested in. But thinking about this virtual futures was really at the heart of what I wanted to do. And uh, the title that I came up with for this talk was There's Nothing Virtual About the Future. And uh, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm someone that, um, you know, Despite Pat saying it's the same shit <laughs> and uh, everything's screwed, I think that's, I was quite optimistic about the future. But, ha but having said that, um, uh, yesterday I went through a series of mass media meltdowns uh, on the way here. My train uh, went wrong, the it was delayed, so clearly there was some screw up with the, the train system that particular morning. I got here late as a result. Also on the way about this point in my journey, my computer decided to die. My MacBook Pro, which is just about a year old, decided to give up, and, and despite the efforts of the most uh, technically equipped people amongst this wonderful community, uh, we concluded that actually it's an Apple genius bar situation. So I didn't really have uh, my presentation finished on the way here, but by that point, didn't have a presentation at all. So what you're seeing here on these, on these slides is in fact the, the handwritten notes that I made yesterday while sitting and listening to all of you talk. Um, but it was a combination of things that, that went wrong as well. I, I, my mobile phone ran out of battery, so I couldn't be on Twitter tweeting or talking to others either here. Just out of interest, how many people, hands up if you are using Twitter during this event, hands up? Say about 20% of the people that are here. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But couldn't do Twitter, couldn't do anything that was really very technological. All I had was this pencil. Um, I had no paper, I had to borrow that from somebody. But by the end of the day, the, the, the pencil wasn't very sharp. I couldn't write with it either. And it's one thing to arrive at a conference and find someone that's got a dongle because you've left yours at home. It's another thing trying to find a pencil sharpener. <laughs> and I don't know whether back in 94 people had pencil sharpeners, um, but certainly I didn't even bother trying to. Uh, anyone got a pencil sharpener here? One at the back. <laughs> Two people. Well, you know, there's reasons to be optimistic about this life. So. <laughs> But nevertheless, it, it felt very much like a, a media meltdown for me. And over the sort of day and a half, I've also thought it'd be nice to try to summarize where we are and what has changed since 1994. And it does seem to me that we have a mixture of beliefs within this room. Uh, and these, I think, are quite neatly summarized by this single capture. And it's all about change, what has actually changed. And we've got um, different views. Some people think that nothing's changed. We're all doing the same sorts of things we were in 1994. Some of them aren't as interesting. Some of them are banal. But we're basically the same. We've got language. We've always had language. It's something that we're, we're not going to surpass. And Twitter and Facebook are all these mechanisms through which we augment the language capacities that humans have developed over uh, centuries. Um, on the other hand, you've got people that think everything's changed. The whole structure of society has been transformed as a result of digital culture. Uh, we are building new relationships with people that we otherwise wouldn't have. We live in a global community that is now uh, constituting our daily lives. Um, so everything's changed. We've also got those people that think, we need to change. It's not quite there yet, but we need to do something to make this world a better place. We need to activate, we need to protest, we need to use these tools, these um, opportunities to bring about some kind of important social change. 
You've got other people that think, screw all that, we want to stay true to ourselves, we can't surpass humanity, we shouldn't worry about all this transhumanist nonsense, we're basically just humans 1.0 still, and we should celebrate that. We've also got those, the naysayers, that think change isn't possible. That in fact, there's something about ourselves that despite the desire to become something else, despite the tools that we might have, we are unable to surpass the kinds of experiences that we've always enjoyed, and therefore uh, nothing much is possible. And finally, we've got those people that would argue that change is imminent. And those are the people you really need to be careful about, because those are the people that will say, watch out, it's coming, it's around the corner. And a lot of those people, um, over the last 15 years, have convinced us that technology is something that we ought to be anxious about, aware of, and mindful of how it's going to change society, mindful of how it's already changed society. Um, my own views about technology, and particularly about digital technology, are... Um, a mixture of those. And of course our views are so complex that some elements of it, of technology, have changed how we live. Others are quite similar. And there's a, there's a kind of uh, belief system, a kind of rhetoric that pervades some of the kind of anti-technology views that, that, that goes along the li following lines. Like everyone here um, may in some way have some relationship to their technology. Pat has her iPad. Uh, Jennifer has her HTC. And um, all of us are wary of the possibility of becoming too immersed in the technology to the neglect of life outside of it. But which of you would admit to that? Which of you would say, I am one of those people, you're right, we are doing too much in social media, it isn't just about that, we should all meet and come together and have conversations. It's always everybody but me. And it seems to me that one of the myths about digital culture today is that everybody is obsessed about being immersed within these environments to the neglect of life outside of them. And I choose my words very carefully here. So I'm not so sure that um, digital culture has brought about um, a change that is to, neg to the neglect of human uh, 1.0. Back in 1994, I was an undergraduate student. And I'd just begun my undergraduate uh, degree. And so the literature that, that uh, many of the people here were developing at the time around this body of, uh, of work uh, was beginning to shape my own thoughts about it. By the time I got to 2002, finished my PhD, and was writing already about these sorts of issues, and I'll go on to talk a bit more about uh, what they involved, um, it was clear that being part of uh, life online, uh, for that to be an important aspect uh, of what it meant to be an academic, I think, was, was quite central to how I thought I should develop. I set up a website. I was one of those people that in 2000, uh, by 2000, I was using my website as a vehicle to get access to things that otherwise I wouldn't be able to. So I would be somebody that would, that would walk into things and claim to be media and demand a, a media pass to get access to them. And that was, for me, a, a quite transformative moment. It was a moment whereby the more recent rhetorics about citizen journalism seemed to be taking place, that in fact you could, just by developing some kind of creative practice through digital culture, uh, bring about some shift in how people relate to you. And that was quite crucial. Uh, you were able to form your own narrative about your life uh, in a way that previously would have been much harder, I think, because I wasn't a journalist, and I'm still not. Uh, 2011, Virtual Futures, 2.0. It seems to me that there's a, there's a need to consider how the concept of virtuality has been theorized over these years, because I'm, a bit, I'm, I'm rather concerned about it. I think partly that the notion of um, the future has been hijacked by the digital delirium, as one of our colleagues put it some years ago, that in fact virtuality is something that, w that we have misconstrued, uh, not necessarily us as, as uh, colleagues that are developing the, the, the concepts and, and intellectual ideas around the subject, but certainly the notion of the virtual within culture has, I think, been hijacked by various narratives. So there were aspects of this period that um, appealed to me. You know, I was one of those people, despite being a, a, re a relative latecomer to that body of people that were writing about digital culture, that thought it would be quite cool to, instead of have a, a book chapter with a proper title, I would I would use a URL as the title, and it was something like cybersex.nobody. It was about cybersex. And, and so this seemed to be a really interesting thing to do, that the idea of, of a title not needing to be a, a real sentence or some kind of sentence fragment appealed to me. I wrote something that was titled Error 404 Not Found, which, you know, 
it's so nostalgic to think of these, these concepts and, and, and remember encountering them, which you know, we still kind of do, I guess. But, uh, but back then, it seemed more of a mystery as to why we ended up with that page than it does today. But the ideas that were shaping my, my own approach to the subject were interspersed with other technological studies. It wasn't just, just digital culture that was, that was shaping my ideas. One of the first major works I put out was a book called Genetically Modified Athletes. And part of what I want to suggest to you, and, and I think what is evidently apparent in the composition of people that is here this weekend, but also what, what I think was the seeds that were planted back in 1994 is that interface between the biological and the digital, which has certainly underpinned my work. But at the same time, a desire to think about uh, what other ways we may become either trans or post-human, but how else we might exist within this world. The genetically modified athlete's proposition uh, appealed to me. The idea that, in fact, aspects of our identity, our biology, may not be taken for granted, may in fact be manufactured in the future. And what would this mean for a range of social practices that we currently enjoy? Would they change them in, in significant ways? In the last few years, since around 2005, 6 I began to work more with artists and designers and uh, found that I think one of the things we could, we could say over this period is that the, um, the kinds of people that are being brought to this conversation have expanded. Um, and so the fact that, that someone like Kevin Warwick would be here, I think, is an example of that, that in fact uh, the disciplinary boundaries that we heard yesterday are simply fictions, um, are are in fact becoming much less robust, both within the academy, but also outside of it. And I'll talk a bit about the relationship between science and society in a moment. But it does seem to me that one of the crucial aspects of what's changed, certainly in the UK, but elsewhere as, as well, is how the relationship between academia, intellectual debate, and various kinds of public has shifted. So over the last few years, I've worked much more with artists and designers to think about the future of humanity and how it might be changed or how indeed it is changing as a result of, of uh, new technologies. One very simple example was a uh, couple of designers at the Royal College of Art, um, James, and, and, uh, James and Jimmy, who were developing a telephone tooth implant, which is as it sounds. You know, you've, you've got a cavity, you go to your dentist, you can have the silver, platinum, gold, or the telephone, which you know, sounds like a peculiar thing, but there was, was a kind of critique on the miniaturization of mobile technology which of course is a, is a narrative that we still see within technology today. Everything's getting smaller, but is it? Their proposition that we could have this tooth, uh, telephone that was implanted in our tooth, um, engaged people morally about the questions, the, the limits of technology, how far we're prepared to go in using it within our person. Um, and again, as, as an aside, they, they decided that they would showcase this at a, at a technology fair and um, and when they were asked by the journalists, when is this going to come out onto the market, they said, oh, we're just artists. This isn't coming out at all. You know, we're just thinking about the ideas. Nobody covered it. Nobody covered it at all. Six months later, they decided to do the same thing again, go to a technology fair with the tooth implant. When they were asked the same question again, they said, it'll be out in six months. And they made the cover of Time magazine with that particular design. <laughs> so what interests me about their work, the work of artists and designers, is that interface between the fact and the fiction, the possibility to create engagement around narratives about the future, which I think are crucial uh, to our engagement with it. You know, I'm a firm believer that in, that in fact fiction gets us further than fact. Um, oh, by the way, as you can kind of tell, I'm, I'm speaking in sentences composed of 140 characters just to help those people that are tweeting along the way. Um, so there's nothing virtual about the future. This seemed like, this is one of those titles, and, and those who have done this kind of work for a while will know, you know, you, you sometimes think very carefully about what sort of title you want to, to put together and, and then speak to it. This is one of those titles where I thought, that sounds good, I'll, I'll do that, and, and then uh, left with the burden of trying to do it. But uh, it seemed to me that the idea of there being nothing virtual about the future appealed to the concept of, of trying to relate the analog to the biodigital. It seems to me these things are, con are concurrent. Uh, we, are, we are both analog beings and biodigital beings. These are not mutually exclusive. We live quite comfortably uh, in, in synthesis between those two ideas. Um, but of course, even the concept of we is problematic here. And, and one of the things we've learned over this last 15 years, uh, which 
I think, is defined by the rise of, of digital cultural studies, uh, the, the, uh, the maturation of that body of literature, whereby methodologies have become more sophisticated, understandings much more complex, and we get the fact that we can't talk generically about any of this stuff, that in fact it's always uh, geographically located and culturally located. So the idea of there being a, uh, you know, a, a digital creative class out there, I think, I think is a myth, and, and, and the rhetorics that surround it about whether we're too digital or too little, I, th I think are, are really open to question. But when thinking about the future, I think we're also uh, misled somehow uh, in, in a ways that can be positive. I, I, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm a believer in, in the, the value of, of fictions to lead us down a path that may have nothing to do with what the future actually turns out to be, but nevertheless engages us in quite interesting ways. So I was at the, the Cheltenham Science Festival a, a couple of weeks ago, and Vivian Parry, who was a former uh, presenter of Tomorrow's World, and for those of you that aren't uh, British or have been in Britain for a while, Tomorrow's World is a BBC flagship science program that's been around for a few decades now. And it was always the kind of program, early evening, uh, early evening program, that would talk about what's coming up in the future and what we ought to be concerned about. And um, Vivian said that uh, one of the things that the program would do is always, at the, you can imagine every spot that they have, at the end of it, they would finish by saying, and it will be available within five years. And that would be how the future was articulated. It was a bracket around which people had to be engaged by. If you said it would be here in 20 years, you know, who cares about that? If it's here within five years, then you really engage people in quite uh, important ways. So she said that irrespective of what we were talking about, what they were talking about, these technologies were likely to be here very, very soon. But her point was, and in fact, that the subject of the talk was, uh, tomorrow's world never comes. Uh, that in fact, the way in which they imagined that future, the way in which they reported the technologies, um, had a very limited relationship to how they actually came into being. She went a bit further in saying that none of the things, none of the things that they actually talked about came into being in the way that they articulated them, but I think that was probably unfair. It seems to me that many of them have, and here's, here's a few of them. Cryonics, food pills, space tourism, electric cars. Now, we could talk about each of those as either being here or not. Um, cryonics, you can do it today. You can uh, sign up for cryonic suspension, which is what some people wish to do in order to have the possibility of coming back to life after they've died. And if you're interested, you can have the head only or full body suspension, depending on your budget. It's about 20,000 for the head only, about 150 for the full body. So depending on what you want to do, you can, you can suspend the whole lot. I mean, you know, clearly Kevin would only suspend the head, but many people here I think would like to keep their bodies too. So this is a possibility. In fact, uh, you know, I know people that have signed up to this. They, they walk around with a, with a necklace that has a little medallion at the end and says, if I die, this is what needs to happen, because what needs to happen needs to happen very quickly. You have to get the body to the place where it needs to be preserved. And if you don't do that quickly, you can't really do very much. Any significant amount of time, the brain turns to jelly, and you can't really expect to bring much back if reanimation becomes a possibility. So yes, reanimation doesn't happen today, but this was a technology that exists, and there are cultures of people that are doing this. Food pills, well, we don't have those, and the sort of standard remark is, of course we don't have those. We like to eat. We like the taste of food. We like the culture of food. It's something that we enjoy, and, and so why would we want food pills? We were wrong about that, or food sprays, or whatever it might be. Um, we also have McDonald's. We have Burger Kings. We have all kinds of foods that perhaps don't celebrate those values of, of you know, culinary culture that, that we appeal to when saying that food pills are a ridiculous idea. And so maybe we're not quite at the food pill stage, but arguably uh, uh, eating has become devalued in, in, in certain parts of our lives. Space tourism, uh, no, you, most of you haven't been up to space um, recently or if at all. Uh, you can do zero gravity flights now, so if you have a spare $2,000, you can, uh, you can do this uh, in the US, in, in Russia, um, not here in the UK yet, but Virgin Galactic has already set up its base within uh, Scotland, so who knows, quite soon there might be that opportunity. Stephen Hawking's done it. Uh, so you know anyone who has that cash can get close to space, and, it, it, and some would argue it's around the corner. Electric cars, of course, we know they're around. They're not necessarily 
I don't have a car. You know, say the people there's a pressure to have cars. I don't have a car, but but of course the uh, the idea of electric cars is something that that seems plausible at this stage. And so the idea that the future is still uh, not likely to happen in the way that they articulated it back then um, is unclear. But what's crucial is that how we describe the future governs our orientation towards it. So we might describe it in any number of ways, as indeed many of the speakers have over this last uh, day and a half. So we might think about our future as being imminent, something that we need to consider immediately. We might think of it as remote, as plausible, as unlikely, imaginary. These are all words that describe and I think uh, define the way in which we respond to the future as something of either significant concern or something that we don't need to worry too much about. Um, it seemed to me that the concept of virtuality within a lot of the literature, the early literature on uh, digital culture, mistakenly located it located cyberspace outside of some other space, which was often mistakenly referred to as the real versus the virtual. Um, I think most people here would argue that, in fact, the, the, those two concepts uh, we should just throw out. The idea that they are separate places, um, metaphysically, I think, is, is problematic. And what I want to suggest is that something that I think many of you would take for granted, that there is consequentiality, consequentiality to life online, life in cyberspace, that we have become able to realize through the contributions of social scientists who have made evident what's actually taking place. But I think one of the consequences of this, one of the consequences of locating virtual space outside of physical space, um, is that it led to its being fetishized, fetishized. It was something that actually made it exciting, that there was this other world that we could be part of now that had different values, different communities, different ways of relating to each other. The body wasn't there. You remember this stuff. Um, it gave it an appeal that I think allowed people to, to become excited about it. And I think that, that's a good thing on the one hand, but it neglected the fact that, that there is consequentiality to what takes place. So um, I think the, rather than the idea of, of it being a, a form of escapism to be online, to be outside of this other world, I think that the fantasy of digital spaces gave the real world greater consequentiality. And in one of the conversations uh, yesterday, it came up that, of course, literature, theatre are all mechanisms through which both escapism but also the interaction between fantasy and reality are played out. Uh, and the way in which those texts affect our sense of the world has, has been apparent for, for years. So the digital experiences are not necessarily a change in kind. They may be just a change in degree. But I still want to argue that, in fact, the uh, consensual, for want of a better word, uh, hallucination of these, of these experiences did give it a tangible reality that was distinct, that, in fact, the, the fantasy became a common part of our real worlds in, in a very powerful way. And we might argue, in response to that, that, in fact, these were hyper-real experiences. They were... They were defined by that fusion between what happened in these online worlds, these digital spaces, and what took place outside of it. So that's the first part. Um, but I still think we may argue that the future is perpetually outside of our reach. And I think that the idea, therefore, that the virtual is an appropriate term to describe these worlds is based on that idea. So the, ver the, the future is something that, it, that never exists in the present. We are always oriented towards the future, whether it's an hour from now, a year from now, or 100 years from now. The future is persistently uh, creeping up on us, if you like. And so um, we are resigned to the fact that we are only ever almost there. And I think the consequence of this is, is an explanation for why virtuality was such an appealing concept, that it created an unreal status to these places, which explained them. It was, it was unreal. It was not quite here yet, and possibly something that we had to realize. And that's a, a very kind of hopeful um, rhetoric, I think, to instill around uh, this technology. So the unrealness of virtual futures was, I think, a central part of, what, of, its, of its currency. However, it wasn't the only uh, unreal process that was affecting us at the time. And in particular, over the last, well, around about the 1994, 1990, um, Biology also became somewhat unreal, in particular with the rise of the Human Genome Project. So at this point in time, not only were we moving online, we were becoming people that existed in these new spaces, these new communities, we also 
had our biology being affected by the development of science. And the Human Genome Project promised a similar unrealness to our future. Um, the unrealness of this, of course, was played out in quite tangible, consequential ways. So um, uh, it led to a, a genetic worldview, the idea that, in fact, the genes that we have are determinant factors in who we are and what we do, or what we may become. And this gave rise to all, all kinds of discourses about um, how society was about to change, that we would need to rethink our ethical foundations, we would need to change our laws, that society, our, our relationships to each other, were all about to go uh, to become uh, not corrupted, but certainly distorted. And even the language we used to relate to each other was going to change as well. So this, this duality, these, these two themes of what was happening over this last 15 years, I think are not coincidental. Um, Gattaca, the film that many of you will have seen about a possible future where genetic selection is taking place as a matter of course, came out of the same year as the second VF conference. Um, these relationships, I think, were central to how we uh, now make sense of, of virtual futures today. Now, when thinking about the interface for these relationships, it seems to me, uh, looking again at the literature of the people that are around us, that media art histories, the people working within this transdisciplinary body of work, were central to shaping those common understandings. Um, and in fact, that interface between the two was essential. But it led to, I think, concerns about what that future might hold. We heard earlier that, that in fact, Cynthia may not have been a synthetic biological organism, maybe some kind of uh, uh, intermediary point between real, uh, not regular biology and synthetic biology. But it seems to me that those common anxieties about the future exist for both the biological and the digital. So this idea that synthetic biology could lead to a system where we patent life, we own life, we commodify it, we attach it to a particular company who owns it, uh, were part of those anxieties. So this idea of microbe soft being the possible owner of this future uh, technology um, raised those similar anxieties that I think pervaded the digital culture era. But similarly, they were also consequential. They had dramatic implications for how people lived their lives. And um, around about the same sort of time, 97, 98, uh, a book was published called The DNA Mystique, which talked about this by Lindley and Nelkin, that described the fact that irrespective of how of what science has achieved already, and by this point, genetic technology has done very little, it's still done very little. Uh, but irrespective of that, the implications of the discourses around genetics were beginning to shape societies in quite profound ways. The genetic worldview was becoming so overwhelming that in fact, the idea of there being such ridiculous things as gay genes or genes for criminality were part of people's common understanding of um, of our biology, of their biology. And so I mentioned uh, near, near the start that I wanted to talk about science and society, and it seemed to me that one of the challenges that's happened over the last 15 years is that you've had greater sophistication in communication within the scientists. You have a lot more, you know, you look at, look at festivals, for example. There's a science festival happening in the UK nearly every couple of weeks. In 1994, that will not have been the case. So you've now got a situation where people that are developing science and technology are finding routes through which to communicate with the public and dialogue with them, which is the polite way it's articulated. On the other hand, they have many opportunities to get the public on board with what they're trying to do. And this is the slightly cynical version of, of that story, that in fact, the rise of, of public understanding of science, of, of trying to engage public with science and technology, is in fact a vehicle through, for simply the the you know, limitless promotion and development of science and technology. So we have to be mindful of that and, and, and aware of the fact that these technological processes operate within a much more sophisticated uh, research and development scene now than they did back then. And in fact, people talk about uh, genetic modification as being the, 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 the worst possible moment for science, where it failed dramatically in being able to convey what it was doing, and everyone got very concerned about Frankenstein technologies and so on. But within the field of bioethics, you begin to see these, these crossovers. So Joe Zielinska published a book called, um, which included the two words, new media and bioethics, within the subtitle. And the idea that these two areas are becoming closer together, I think, is part of what will define virtual futures over the next few years. 
we heard from Stellark and other people, Kevin, for example, who talked about those challenges with being um, with doing work that engaged professionals who otherwise wouldn't be modifying people in such a way, uh, but now they're taking place. And those relationships between artists and scientists, the crit critical art ensemble, which we also heard about yesterday, I think are indicative of that shift. Um, the tangible implications for regular people is also crucial. So we are, um, we are able to save the, the cord blood from our children to protect them against leukemia. But if you do that, and I have a one-year-old son, we tried to do it last year. But in fact, if you wanted to do that, you have to compromise the natural birth, so we didn't. Uh, but you can do that and pay again. It's, everything's about 2,000 pounds, it seems, similar for cord blood. Um, we heard yesterday or a bit today about Aubrey de Grey and the possibility of life extension. These ideas are embedded within digital culture. They wouldn't be possible without digital technologies, as we heard also yesterday in the talk about health and, and digital technology. So there's this relationship that has emerged between biology and digital culture that I think is, uh, is really expanding right now. It's becoming a, a defining element of what we're thinking about in the future. And I want to end this talk uh, just by a, a very simple point. Um, this is a, a tweet reply that I got from John Perry Barlow. Um, who knows who John Perry Barlow is? Hands up. So a few of the people that were probably here in 1994. Uh, one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, so I got a tweet from, I, I don't know John. I've never met him. I've not even tweeted him before. But this morning I thought, well, we've got all these people here that are part of that era. Uh, I'm going to see if he's online and on Twitter and, and see if he has something to say. Um, so I found his Twitter account, and he was in Delhi. He's been in India for the last few days. And I said to him, what have you got to say to the people that are here at this conference, this, this groundbreaking uh, but also quite nostalgic conference about what's happened to digital culture in the last 15 years? And he said the following. The fact that we've had more of the same for so long that it's no longer the same. And this seemed very an appropriate way to, to kind of conclude this talk. And I think that the idea that, in fact, yes, there's a great deal that is the same, we're not simply living online. We're not simply immersed within our technologies. But in fact, those experiences, and in fact, we don't even know what people are doing in these worlds. We have our own experience of them, but that could be very different from what someone else next to us is using them for or indeed getting out, getting out of them. For example, um, I have two Twitter accounts, my own, and then I have Futura Mia, um, which is a Twitter account that is pulling RSS feeds from everything that I'm interested in and pulling it into one account and tweeting the whole lot. So a journal, for example, new table of contents, it comes into that RSS feed, into the Twitter account, and so everything goes there. I just go to one place to look at all the stuff I'm interested in. Um, now, if you're not doing that, that might be a great way of streamlining your life so you don't become obsessed with being online. But I think that it's, it's not necessarily something that everybody's doing. So the fact that we still know very little about many of these practices is exacerbated by the fact that they come and go very quickly. We don't know whether Twitter will be here in five years. And so to spend time investigating sociological processes that in the end may, may cease to exist in the same way within a very short period of time presents a very big challenge for particularly people researching the field. And it seems to me that um, one of our challenges is in trying to develop methodologies that are applicable to new platforms that we still don't yet know will exist. So thank you very much.